Hello, I'm Dr. Basil Considine. I'm here from the ACU Online Writing Center, and today we're going to be talking about how to promote practice changes. Now, one of the truisms in life is that change is constant, with the corollary that people resisting change is almost always constant as well. And so today we're going to be talking about how to lay the groundwork for convincing other people to participate in change that they may not necessarily be interested in doing when you begin. If you're new to the Online Writing Center, we work with students at many different points in the writing process, from just starting out, wanting to learn more about writing or graduate level writing, as the case may be, or brainstorming on ideas, workshopping paragraphs, thesis statements, research questions, up to and including feedback on partial or complete paper drafts. You can sign up for an appointment by going to my.acu.edu under the drop-down list of quick links or resources, select the Online Writing Center, and just follow the instructions. There are two types of appointments you can sign up for, an asynchronous appointment where you reserve a time. By the time that rolls around, you upload a copy of your paper and any special request for feedback, like, oh, could you please look at this starting on page four, for example. Or my professor has said, I... I should work on this. Can you give me feedback, particularly in that area? Always happy to accommodate. Or you can sign up for a real-time phone or Zoom appointment where you will join us and be able to ask your questions and get your answers in real time. Either is fine. The scheduling process is the same. Just look for whether you're signing up for one appointment type or the other. And uh, if in doubt, you can always send us a question. You can always send questions to onlinewritingcenter at acu.edu. Most things that we can just answer right away. If you're looking for some more detailed feedback that's more appointment length, uh, we might uh, suggest that you make an appointment for that, but you can always start by emailing. Now, just to, to clarify things, when you start out at my.acu.edu, it'll eventually take you to the WC Online scheduling system, but you will be submitting your paper draft itself through Canvas. Uh, you can also check your paper to make sure that you've cited and quoted uh, passages correctly, right, that you've marked all quotations as quotations through Turnitin. So just because you upload to the Canvas doesn't mean that we're going to look at it because some students will use it just to check to make sure their quotes are marked correctly. You need to have both the appointment and to upload your paper in Canvas. And then we'll generally be getting feedback to you within 24 hours. Uh, might be a faster if it's a major holiday weekend might take a little bit longer if it's a easter weekend all right uh if you go to our writing webinars page we post all of our webinar recordings and we normally record all of our webinars by default we post them to this page at the top you'll see a calendar but if you scroll down there's this tab guide so you can find our webinars that relate to specific courses by selecting the program code and then just looking and they're sorted by course number and then within that by the week in which they correspond to a particular assignment. So for example for HCAD you would select HCAD and it will show you all the HCAD courses that have tie-in webinars. You'll see me using our APA course paper template later. We also have a YouTube channel which makes it easy to watch our webinars on the go. Things to get posted to our main webinars page first and then to the YouTube channel lags a little bit, uh, but we also have a blog. All right, uh, today we're going to start by talking about some negotiation strategy fundamentals to kind of prepare the terminology for some of the things that we're going to be looking at. We'll talk our way through a sample assignment that has uh, negotiation strategies as a fundamental aspect of what you're being asked to do. And then we'll finish by talking about how you might use the no tears plan for paragraph writing which we teach in our synthesis and analysis webinars. We'll sh talk about how to use that to help plan and organize your information in the context of preparing for negotiation. So let's talk some of those negotiation strategy fundamentals. And you'll find many different ways of approaching negotiation, including ones for the reading for this particular assignment, but there's some broad agreement on the styles of negotiation, and one of the more common systems divides it into five primary styles, where accommodating is where you present a, a 
appreciation or weighing or consideration of someone else's values more than your own. They say, we can't do this unless X. You say, oh, of course we will uh, accommodate that. Now, accommodations can be major and minor. Uh, for example, if the accommodation is, uh, you know, they want meetings to take place on a certain day or in a certain area, you know, that, that may be a more reasonable accommodation for you to meet. There may be some that are valued greater because it's a larger imposition. And uh, this is something where at some diplomatic conferences, how you acknowledge, introduce, and honor things can be the subject of a lot of negotiations and people agree to a trade-off in different accommodations to get the thing that they want more. Avoiding this probably doesn't need too much introduction, but in negotiation, when you avoid an issue or you avoid a claim, uh, sometimes it is the best way to proceed. Uh, there's a saying, there, there was a giant elephant in the room that no one would mention. Uh, that is very true in many negotiations, and especially when it involves an aggrieved party and the negotiators agree implicitly or explicitly to work around that. Collaborating, this is when you are working together to achieve some shared end. Uh, th this is something where perhaps one of the most notorious collaborations in his Western European history is the so-called Partition of Poland, it, the three partitions actually, in the late 18th century, where three neighbors, Russia, Prussia, uh, and Austria, agreed amongst themselves that uh, they would take bits of Poland. It was very hard for Poland to object effectively when its three big neighbors were all taking pieces of it, and shortly the nation ceased to exist as a separate country until it was revived after World War One. So collaborating uh, with that somewhat extreme example, collaboration allows many things to be possible, and most of those are thankfully benign. Competing. So this is when you are trying to get your your best thing at the expense of the other party. It is in some ways an opposite of accommodation. Uh, you may have multiple parties competing for something with different priorities, and what may be a deal breaker for one may not be another. Um, if we take uh, another example from the 20th century, after World War II, there were a number of naval treaties that were agreed between different uh, countries to restrict and cut back on our arms buildup. And so the Treaty of London was negotiated with competing interests. Uh, in this case, the United Kingdom, or the British Empire at the time, wanted to be able to cut back on the size of its fleet because it, the country was close to bankruptcy. And uh, meanwhile, countries that had spent less on the war were less interested, but they had other things that they wanted. And the United States wanted to not have any standing military alliances between other countries. Uh, Japan at the time had a alliance with the British Empire. And, you know, to achieve other interests, because they could only afford so much of a naval buildup themselves, they were willing to, uh, shall we say, to give some concessions. And in this way, the competing interests were played off to achieve a global reduction in arms. Compromising. Uh, now, where competing and compromising trade-off is another one of those things where uh, you may a believe that the other party is compromising and they don't see it as that, and vice versa. Uh, so compromising is when you give up some of your own interests or you decrease your ask, your request, what you're insisting on in order to attain something. So as a, an example here, so a compromise that occurred after the um, after World War II, uh, it, with the creation of the United Nations, there were different sets of language that different parties argued for in what became eventually the uh, Declaration of Human Rights. And various parties argued that some things should be said there that ultimately were not included because the parties compromised to get something that they could all agree on. 
and ultimately, did it have all the things they wanted? No, but there were subsequent UN things and other modifications later. Now, you might also be familiar with the seven elements of negotiation, and you'll find different numbers in the list, but generally agreed on seven elements that people have interests, that there's the concept of legitimacy, what is right, what is fair, what is how things should be, uh, what is appropriate. So, for example, you know, if you steal something, uh, you know, that, that may, is usually regarded as an illegitimate uh, act, one without legitimacy. Relationships. You might be doing things to preserve or try and create a relationship. Alternatives. You know, what else you could do? And then there's also the related concept called BATNA, the best alternative to negotiated agreement. Options, you know, presenting, okay, here's different things we could do. Can we agree on one or more of those? Commitments, what your obligations are. And communication. Now, I mention these seven things because they factor in greatly in how you explain and present your argument and how you justify making things like concessions. So one of the truisms in romance and in a long-term relationship like uh, marriage is that you recognize you have shared interests. So if you're married and you're raising kids, hopefully you agree that you want your kids to be raised well and to turn out, out well. Uh, legitimacy, we could make a reference to marriage and kids there that I'll avoid. Uh, legitimacy, you know, what is appropriate. So for example, you might have uh, the principle of, okay, uh, you earned that, this is yours. As you didn't earn that, it's not yours. And that could have all sorts of examples. For example, if you're giving someone allowance, if you just take that money back, whatever you feel like it, then it's not really theirs. And they will probably view it as an illegitimate action. Uh, relationships, what are you trying to build, maintain, or sometimes break? Um, I think the last stat I saw said that 40% of marriages end in divorce. Your interest may be in getting out of a relationship, or it may be in creating or sustaining or maintaining one or repairing one. Uh, those alternatives, you know, if you go to a relationship counselor, they're probably going to you know, say, okay, well, what do you want to do? Here are the different ways I see this could go. You walked in saying, I want to divorce. Would you consider talking first? Uh, that, that being presented as an alternative. Now, options would be more like, they say, well, we could try and put this together. You could say you're done. You could give them one last chance. Commitments. Well, if you have ch children, uh, besides the, your interest in their turning out well, you know, what sort of financial, logistical, emotional, and more does that entail to you uh, that you feel that either as parents or interested parties or something else, what are the obligations or commitments that you have to fulfill? And communication uh, is both the simplest to explain and one of the hardest to do, especially when parties in a negotiation stop talking to each other, make whatever relationship analogies you wish there. Now, sacred issues and sacred values are closely related concepts. So let's agree that sacred values are cultural rules about appropriate behavior. Cultural can be many things. It can be religious. It could be national. It could be local. Uh, I lived in the upper Midwest for many years. One of the local cultural rules is that you don't just tell someone to their face in public, you know, that's a dumb idea. Uh, instead, in Minnesota, for example, you would say, oh, that's a thing. And then you allow the other person to say face, and then you might tell them in private all the reasons why that's a dumb idea. Perhaps not even explicitly, but still strongly suggest that something not as it should be. So cultural rules, uh, you know, this is idea of this is how we do things. Now, sacred issues are not necessarily religious. In this case, we're defining sacred as something where the person will never make a trade-off on this particular issue. Now, if we go back to that discussion about relationships and divorce, 
it turns out that there's a lot of things that are presented as sacred issues that people act as if they're sacred, that they can never make a trade-off, but that they are, in fact, interested or willing to make in the right circumstances. And so we arrive at the concept of pseudo-sacred issues, something that when you can afford to it, when you have the luxury of treating it as sacred, you don't uh, uh, compromise on it. But push comes to shove, you are willing to wiggle on that at least a little bit. Now, there's actually an example of this in the uh, Holy Bible, in the Christian Bible, uh, Jewish Bible, uh, where uh, the Israelites are being oppressed by foreign conquerors and that uh, they're staging a revolution. And one group says, oh, well, it's the Sabbath, uh, you know, there's, there's this enemy army coming, but we're good religious people, we can't fight on, on the Sabbath, and unfortunately they all get killed. Now, the, their fellows say, well, you know, it, if we get attacked, it, the other people are violating the Sabbath, we're just defending ourselves. And so they've defended themselves and were not killed. So that's something that was originally being approached as a sacred issue. But push comes to shove, the second group said, uh, you know, there's an exception to that. And so they were willing to defend themselves on the Sabbath, despite otherwise being observant about not uh, beginning work or not fighting of their own accord. So whether when you say they treat it as sacred when convenient is condescending or just pragmatic, that may be subjective. But if it's something that is no normally treated as sacred, but there is some wiggle room, yeah, that can be negotiable. And we can think about many countries in history that have had conflicts over things that were presented as sacred, but have not stopped them from uh, becoming friends, allies, compatriots, partners in many things. And uh, certainly in business, business and politics sometimes make strange bedfellows of people who may have said quite publicly that they would never work together, but were willing to compromise. So now let's talk about this assignment that is drawn from the Healthcare Administration Program. So this is coming from HCAD 632. This is the week three Respecting the Sacred assignment. So it's, this is out of the larger Conflict Management in Healthcare Organizations course. And the, the assignment begins with the preamble. You've been tasked with the job of convincing senior physicians in a large hospital to stop performing percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, or stent procedures, for patients with stable angina. You have been asked to convince older physicians to change their behavior regarding this procedure without impinging on their autonomy. More on that in a little bit. You are aware that several physicians will disagree with the research you are presenting. In order to prepare for this conversation, you have decided to review key conflict management principles, including the concept of sacred issues in medicine, strategies for framing, reframing, and boundaries, and a plan for dealing with avoidance. Now, if we hearken back to our earlier discussion about the primary styles of negotiation, you'll probably recognize avoidance as number two here. Uh, definitely something where some people choose to enter a, a request to change something by simply avoiding it. All right. Now, if we look at the instructions proper, we see that this is supposed to be three to four full pages discussing conflict management principles to help you prepare for this challenging conversation. And then we have the instructions to use a provided outline as a template for writing it. And it should be written AP style with in-text citations and reference page. So that's all standard APA stuff. And then our outline is divided into four parts. Introduce the issue, discuss sacred issues in medicine, and frame the issue, uh, reframe it, and outline the boundaries between professional and administrative staff within a hospital. And avoidance and engagement, what kind of strategies will you have for dealing with that? Uh, now, engagement is the process of getting people involved. And if we were to go look back at this list here. Uh, engagement is usually about bringing people to either the collaborating or compromising point. 
paired with these seven elements of negotiation, uh, you know, often it starts with the communication part and will often involve something about those interests or relationships, or, but it can also involve presenting alternatives or options. Probably not alternatives in this particular case, although there are many that would come up in medicine. And if we look at the assignment rubric, we see a couple things that weren't highlighted as clearly in the instructions. And so first, we, if we look at this, at how many points are to ascribed to different sections, we get an idea for the relative length. Not uh, absolutely must be this exact proportion, but if you look at it, we see summarizes the issue of stents and coronary artery disease. That gets one point. But defining the sacred issues and explaining why it might be a sacred issue, that gets three points. It's 30% of the grade. And then 20% each goes to the framing, reframing boundaries and enough for the strategies for dealing with avoidance and engagement. So we see that while we should certainly discuss the issue of stents and summarize what was in the reading, that is going to be the brief introduction to the larger so, with that, let's go ahead and talk about how you might go about outlining this. And for this, we're going to make reference to the No Tears Plan. So, if you ha are watching this on video and you're very familiar with the No Tears Plan or practicing it, you might skip ahead a little bit to when you start seeing Microsoft Word being shared on screen. But, for those of you not familiar with it, the No Tears Plan is a approach for planning out a graduate level writing, the kind of paragraphs you'd be expected to do in a master's or doctoral program. And it, it, you have a full length webinar you could watch, an applied webinar uh, if you're interested in seeing how that works with a more narrow issue. But essentially, the No Tears Plan, the name stands for nothing omitted, topic sentence, so start out by telling us what you're writing about in the paragraph give us evidence and argumentation to support the claim that you've made in your topic sentence, analysis, discuss the evidence and how it connects to your topic. Uh, for most things, you'll want to give more than just one piece of evidence and more than one bit of analysis, so repeat as necessary. Uh, synthesis, that's when you discuss what these things mean considered together. What is the larger thing of our having all this evidence that you've discussed or we have what is the result from having conflicting evidence, what should be done. And then if you are all done with your argument, you might have a concluding or transitioning sentence, or you might jump to the next paragraph to continue your argument if it's something that takes more than one paragraph. Now, analysis and synthesis, I'm going to run through this quickly because we do have those longer webinars. But uh, analysis and synthesis are different ways of working with the information that's presented. Analysis is when you explain what something means or how it is or why it is important. Synthesis is when you make new meaning from something. So and together there are ways of walking the reader through your argument, not just presenting evidence but explaining how or why it is important and important to your context. And the synthesis is the, all right, so what new thing do we know, guess, or otherwise understand based on this? So let's drill down on analysis. You might understand that as discussing the evidence of the argumentation. And this is often going to involve comparing different evidence. For example, research has shown that increased levels of self-awareness often result from self-leadership interventions in the workplace. According to Macedo, the goals of self-leadership interventions should be explored further. Well, that's just giving evidence. Uh, you know, research has shown this thing. This person said that thing. What it doesn't tell us whether this is broadly accepted, whether it's a good idea, is it backed up by data, or anything like that. Now, if we were to add some analysis here, all right, uh, research has shown that increased levels of self-awareness often result from self-leadership interventions in the workplace. This aligns with my own experience after training I hosted for local business owners. It's saying, oh yes, my professional observations agree with that research. Now, you probably don't want to exclusively rely on your personal observations, but 
having that combined with the research strengthens the argument. And if you're analyzing your own workplace, it would be highly relevant to talk about what you have observed. According to Macedo, the goals of self-leadership inventions, interventions should be explored further. My research will add to existing literature on the effects of such interventions in business leadership training programs. So what does the Macedo quote have relevance for? Oh, it's justification for your project, which will be doing that thing that they suggested. Now, if you're talking about how different authors agree, you might add some phrasing like in alignment with and reference the thing that agrees with it or that found similar results. Like in alignment with the cheat gate, Emmanuel discovered that COPD patients responded positively to the treatment over one year. But you might also be introducing important information that changes how you would view things. So Smith 2010 found that birth order and personality traits were connected. However, Smith's results are less likely to be generalizable due to the use of a small homogeneous population of 11 siblings. Now, I don't know about you. I'm from a family of 11. People tell me all the time that my experiences are not like theirs growing up. Probably because I had a lot, lot, lot more siblings than they did. And there are lots of things that within my family might be normal, but would not necessarily be normal in other places. Example, as an older sibling, I have a lot of practice putting babies to sleep and changing diapers. And so when my friends start having babies for the first time, they're often very surprised that I can put their babies to sleep. But I've also had literally years more experience than they do when they're starting. So that is a key piece of information that changes how you understand things. And that, therefore, analysis. Now, synthesis is when you're taking different pieces of evidence together and you're using that to create new meaning. And it could be about applying it to a context. It could be considering things together and saying, okay, here's the trend or here's the application or here's what this suggests to do. And this is probably the thing that is left out the most often when people are writing graduate level papers early on in their studies, because it's something that is sometimes discouraged in undergraduate writing, the idea that you don't have the base of knowledge or experience or the expertise to opine yet. Uh, I would argue that synthesis is well placed at any level of writing, but uh, it is especially important at the graduate level. Now that synthesis is often going to be answering questions like, well, what does this mean when you consider it together? Uh, how do you as the author interpret what you presented? Or what should be done in light of these things that you have presented and analyzed to us? Going back to that question about, uh, well, are these results generalizable? You might follow with a synthesizing statement like, therefore, we should use Rene 2015 suggestion instead, because that was done with a larger sample. Or it might be a noting that while Smith's results were small, that they align with something else, so we're going to follow that anyway, as the case may be. Now, when we are looking at this, you might be wondering, what is this going to look like? Well, it's going to depend on the type of information you're discussing. So, for example, these consistent results across multiple studies is the kind of thing that you'd find in a paragraph we've presented multiple pieces of evidence from different studies. These consistent results across multiple studies and diverse populations validate the applicability of the behavioral therapy model to this problem. Or you might be saying, well, this, this is something that is worth exploring more, like the recent research on the positive impact of mindful-based stress reduction training in various contexts means that it could also be an effective tool for higher education administration. Uh, personally, I would go with suggest that, but it's pretty close in meaning to means that. Or if you're talking about interpreting statistical analysis, you might have something like, oh, a p-value less than 0 0.05 is typically considered to be statistically significant Therefore, the null hypothesis was rejected. Okay, that is definitely synthesizing language. All right, now, before we go any further, I'm going to strongly suggest that you grab a copy of our APA course paper template. And if you're watching on this 
on video, you might pause to go download that. Now, I've gone ahead and I have copied and pasted the assignment instructions into this uh, document, to this copy of the template, and I've just typed in the title here. So, how might we go about outlining this using the No Tears plan? Well, a good way to start is to just give you yourself a list of things to include. Now, this R you can replace with E or A as necessary, and you can always insert more, but we're going to be looking for paragraphs at around five to seven sentences. And the topic sentence is going to lay out the issue and possibly also the uh, larger thing in the paper. So now, what I'm going to type here is not going to be a summary of the article because if you're doing that particular assignment, you will be uh, doing that summary yourself. But we can see, looking at this, there are a couple things that we want to mention. One of which is that there's the issue and one of which is the application. So there's a general issue and then the specific one at this hospital. So you, you can phrase that in a way such as uh, changing medical practices at, and then insert location, is a significant challenge because this is particularly a true. Now, just because it starts out as multiple sentences doesn't mean that you can't merge this. And once you get the ideas down, you can say, okay, uh, this is actually something where I can just merge those together. And whether you're talking about stents in coronary artery disease and stable angina or something else, there are plenty of things. But if we look at this, this basic formula introduces, oh, here's this thing that we're trying to do, something about the site or context, and usually this is more general, and then this is more specific. So you might understand that that is the location or context, and then here you might zero in on a particular hospital. Now, I sometimes work at Children's National Hospital in Washington, D.C., and this is a wonderful institution. Uh, I will say that any large institution, you will expect that there will be some difference in opinion about what to do and what may be best practice within one group may not be acknowledged as best practice by another. And each group will have its reasons and finding a accommodation, finding an agreement is going to be something for the administrators and department heads and more to work out. So this is very much the sort of thing that you will encounter things like this if you're working in healthcare administration. Now evidence is going to involve summarizing things from the Lancet article. Uh, so you might make a note for yourself, even without reading it yet, a note that here, okay, uh, why current practice is not good. <laughs> or it might be, and you might add well, okay, why new practice is better. And the analysis, you know, how, how do you know that based on it? Now, something that you will find any time when you are in an emergency department is that when people are discussing potential treatments with colleagues, they will talk about what they've learned. Now, it could be from Grand Rounds, it could be from a article that they read, it could be a recommendation or something that they saw other people doing. But with that discussion, there'll be the analysis, like, will that work for here? Will that be appropriate? And that could be as basic as, well, that research was done with adults, but Children's National is a pediatric hospital. What should we do? Or what might we do differently? And sometimes there'll be guidelines for that, sometimes there won't be. At some point, having put in your evidence and your analysis, you will probably remove this R because you did the repetition. And then you're going to have the synthesis. <laughs> well, what's that going to be? Uh, you, know, you, you could be saying, well, uh, to apply the, the guidelines is expected to have whatever benefits. I don't know what that'll be. You'll come up with your own after reading that article. Now, if we come 
to this part. And I do remind you that this Sacred Issues in Medicine section gets 30% of the grade for the paper. So if there's any section that's going to be longer than the others, this is probably it. And I would say, based on having been given three bullets, probably going to have at least three paragraphs here, one for each of those bullets. And so you can start and lay out your outline here and say, okay, well, for each of these, I know there's going to be a topic sentence because you should always start your paragraph with a topic sentence. And I should be discussing some evidence and analyzing it and synthesizing it eventually. And so we can look at this and then as you are doing your reading, you can add other things. And some of it might be institutional knowledge. Uh, as an example, uh, the, this assignment refers specifically to the senior physicians. Well, if you're a senior physician, you've been practicing for a while, there may be things that your body of experience gives you a certain perspective on and that may not involve the same thing as the researchers have, for better or for worse. And so you may see this as something where you were told not to do it, where you just saw bad outcomes, and there are a lot of those with good intentions that happen. So what is that going to be? Uh, yeah, you'll come up with your own argument for why uh, these issues may be a sacred issue for physicians. But if you look at the strategy for negotiating, well, if you know that you're going to have to describe the strategy for negotiating the sacred, then as you do the week's readings, you can start putting in the evidence and come up with the, the central thesis that will be described in your topic sentence and fill that in as you go. Now, if we look at this next one, and here, framing and boundaries, uh, that could be multiple paragraphs. I think it's probably going to be at least two. And how that's going to be structured? Well, a way to do it is to start with the things that are laid out in the outline. So they have framing and reframing in that order, and they are closely related. Uh, boundaries. And then see if your argument requires or merits an additional paragraph beyond that. But that's a good place to start to say, okay, well, let's give ourselves a paragraph with a topic sentence and everything else. And then avoidance and engagement. Ah, strategies for dealing with this. So now what is the going to, topic sentence going to be? Well, it's probably going to list the main strategy or strategies that, that you will use. Now, what that will be exactly, uh, I think you will determine that as you are brainstorming, possibly while you're doing the reading, but you can put that down here and then follow it up with, well, okay, well, why is that effective? And then, again, repeat as necessary, so you might have more evidence or more analysis. And then what does that mean? We'll put together. Now you're probably going to have some sort of conclusion here. Uh, with a, a paper that's three to four pages long, it's probably not going to be huge, maybe four to five sentences, but uh, certainly a wrap it up. Okay, well, given all the things that you've mentioned, in brief, what is your plan? And that will be very easy to work out what should go in there after you have filled in all these details in your outline. So let's recap here. So we began by talking about some negotiation strategy fundamentals, including the five primary styles of negotiation. We talked about the seven elements of negotiation, including, notably for this particular one, what are the interests and what are the options here? Now, the senior physician, uh, there is the, the question of what are they doing themselves versus what they are supervising. Now, I don't know about your particular context. I do know that in some hospitals, there are cases where senior physicians have agreed to uh, allow the physicians under supervision, whether that's the attendings, whether that is the senior resident, whether it is the lower ranking residents and interns to do things uh, that they themselves will not do. And that that's an example of 
physicians using their best judgment for the patients that are most directly in their care. You know, people don't always reach the a decision that you would, and that doesn't mean it's a bad decision, but it does mean not necessarily what you would. And so in the negotiation, you might pick one or more of these elements to focus on to try and get the other party on board. We also talked about sacred issues, sacred values, and the concept of pseudo-sacred issues. You know, is this something going to be a sacred issue in the sense that they won't allow something contrary to that, that won't allow a different practice? I don't know. That'll depend on your interpretation of the reading and the argumentation. But there may be something that you say, okay, well, this is being presented as a sacred issue, but is it necessarily that? To give an example from a session that I was at today, a, someone was saying, yes, normally a, uh, we will, this is in a pathology lab, normally we will process everything within 20 minutes. But if it seems like it really needs more time, we can take more time. And so that it turns out that that turnaround time of 20 minutes for the pathology lab uh, was not a sacred issue. Uh, it was more what they aimed for, but if they thought you know, this will be better for the patient, they would spend more time on it. So that made it a pseudo-sacred issue rather than a sacred one. And you may find things like that when you're writing, either for this paper or for another one, that you say, okay, a, is there room for negotiating around this? Or perhaps... Uh, let's we agree on our interests. We are trying to do the best thing for the patients. That if we agree on that, can we talk about some of the options we have for how to do that? And uh, you know more on that in your reading, of course. And then so we wrap that up after discussing this assignment. We wrapped it up by talking about how to take a no tears plan and its principles of presenting a organized argument, starting with your clear topic sentence about whatever your claim is for the paragraph, giving supporting evidence and argumentation, analyzing it by discussing that evidence and how it connects to your topic, repeating as necessary, and synthesizing. And with that, if you have any questions about this, or if you're having trouble finding any of the webinars that we referenced, uh, please feel free to send us an email at onlinewritingcenter.acu.edu. You can go to my.acu.edu to sign up for an appointment online and visit the Online Writing Center for links to our videos, templates, and many other resources. Have a good night.